Uh, this time, I'm going to talk about uh, Japan. And of course, Japan is far, far away, right? and it is important, and it is quite difficult for you nowadays to visit Japan or to travel Japan. So uh, even though now I'm not in Japan, but uh, I would like to really uh, uh, introduce uh, the current Japan as it is, because uh, sometimes Japan is uh, misunderstood, uh, and uh, sometimes the, the rapid transformation of Japanese society, Japanese culture, uh, cannot be easily noticed in news media, which you are usually watching in the United States. So uh, as a Japanese scholar and uh, as a scholar of uh, international relations, I'm usually uh, teaching international politics and international history to students. And also I often join in uh, uh, well, international conferences on various issues such as uh, international security and uh, politics in the, in the Pacific, of course, US-China, confrontation nowadays, I uh, join many kinds of webinars and the international conferences. So um, my, my talk is basic, based upon my expertise on international politics and international history. But uh, I, today, I'm not going to uh, go into details about those kind of international politics. But on the other hand, uh, rather than that, I would really like to uh, talk about what Japan is like today, and I'm using a PowerPoint slide to uh, uh, clarify my talk. Uh, and uh, first of all, I uh, like to move the next slide, introduction. Uh, Japan has become uh, today culturally and racially diverse society in the last decade. So this is a great transformation in the last 10 years. Well, if you visited Japan maybe one or two decades before, you could perhaps feel that, well, basically Japan is uh, full of Japanese people and uh, not so many foreign people were there. But nowadays, on the other hand, if you go to a convenience store in Tokyo, and if you go to a, a restaurant or if you go to a bars or those kind of, uh, 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 shops and so on in Tokyo and elsewhere, you can find so many foreigners. Rather than that, if you go to convenience store like 7 Elevens and so on, it's sometimes difficult to find Japanese shopkeepers. Basically, those shops are run by, uh, or if you uh, go to these stores, you usually uh, talk with non Japanese people uh, because. Uh, and uh, like, like New York cab taxi or London taxi, uh, well, in these areas in Tokyo nowadays, uh, 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 Tokyo is full of those foreign people. But uh, not just that, because they live longer in Tokyo or in Japan, and they sometimes, of course, have children, and they uh, grow on, grown, uh, grown up in Japan or in Tokyo. So that's why in schools, uh, like my university, Kyo University, there are so many uh, well, who are not actually ra uh, racially or ethnically Japanese. So uh, if I talk about something to my students in Japanese university, I have to be careful about those kind of uh, ethnic or racial diversity, because there are many Chinese, and a third of my uh, graduate students uh, uh, department politics uh, actually Chinese, of course, there are so many Koreans. So uh, I am always aware of these kind of diverse nature of my students, not just in Japanese university, but elsewhere as well, basically. And then I would also like to point out in the beginning that Japan has a long tradition of merging foreign culture with Japanese tradition, more than a thousand years. In the beginning, uh, like uh, 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 well, 12 centuries before, uh, around uh, the year to the year 800 or something, uh, we began to introduce Chinese culture or religion, like uh, Buddhist religions or Confucianist religion or, or culture. So since then, we have had a very difficult question to try to combine the two things, our own tradition and foreign culture, largely Chinese culture. We have to, and we want to maintain our own traditional culture. But at the same time, because for many centuries, 
Chinese civilization were much more superior to, to Japanese civilization. That's why we needed to learn so many things from China. So we introduced Chinese characters, but uh, Japanese language is not as same as Chinese language. We have some Chinese characters, but that not, that not all. We have all our own Japanese characters. So Japanese character is basically the combination of Chinese character and the Japanese character, that hiragana, which maybe uh, some of you might be familiar with. So uh, we have here in Japan a very long tradition, more than 1,000 years, traditional combining or merging our own tradition with foreign culture. And then we create our own identity. So uh, that's why I, in the beginning, I said that Japan is sometimes misunderstood that we usually are seeing that Japan has too, too strong nationalism or too strong our own cultural tradition. Maybe that might be true, but uh, we are proud of a long historical tradition of merging different kinds of culture. So in that sense, Japan was in the middle of the 19th century, Japan was the best country, I would say, uh, which could combine with Western civilization with our own culture tradition, because we had done it for many centuries by combining Chinese civilization with our own Japanese civilization. So it's not really difficult for us in the middle 19th century to switch from Chinese civilization to Western civilization but uh, Western civilization could not dominate Japan, Japanese culture or Japanese cultural tradition or Japanese mindset, because always uh, we have been introducing some of the superior civilizations, but uh, of course, superior civilization could not easily dominate Japanese people because Japanese people are good at combining the two things. So let me move on to the second, the next slide. So uh, you can see some of the pictures of Japanese, or all, all of them are Japanese in a sense, but uh, maybe they are not the typical images of Japanese people perhaps to you. They are not quite seen as typical Asian people. I, I think that most of you know the name Osaka Naomi, a quite famous tennis player, professional tennis player who, who, who sometimes won uh, a, 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 a big tournament, even in the United States, I suppose. And also you, some of you who are familiar with uh, uh, basketball, uh, perhaps know the name Rui Hachimura. Uh, Rui Hachimura is in Washington DC, playing in uh, uh, Washington Wizards. So many of my friends in Washington DC who are researching on international affairs, international politics, in think tanks or universities, uh, fun, big fun of uh, Rui Hachimura because, because of his joining uh, Wizards uh, is becoming stronger, of course, with some difficulties, but still uh, he, he is a hero in uh, uh, Washington Wizards. So it's quite new that uh, Japanese basketball player actually uh, uh, is so famous among American people. We are very glad to see it. And there are some other names like baseball player, like uh, maybe some of you might know the name of uh, Darwish and uh, you Darwish uh, 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 and uh, she's not playing in uh, Padres in uh, American uh, uh, major league baseball. He actually, uh, his father was Iranian. And so he, when he came to the United States, he had some difficulties because the United States had some difficulties in its diplomatic relationship with Iran, but he could overcome, uh, uh, overcame some difficulties in coming to the United States, like many immigrants. So uh, I think uh, they're heroes, uh, but at the same time, they, uh, 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 they have a kind of a, a little bit complicated background racially or ethnically, but they are heroes nonetheless. So in the sense, uh, what I talk about uh, previously, I mean, the, the quite diverse nature of current Japanese society can be easily noticed by looking at these pictures, I suppose. 
Uh, then I, uh, well, uh, I'm proud of saying that uh, if we think about the gold medal, I mean the numbers of gold medals in the in these years, uh, 2020 Summer Olympic game, uh, Japan is ranked number three after United States and China. Previous, of course, uh, this was the best among Japanese records. I mean, in this Tokyo Olympic game in the summer, we could get uh, such a huge numbers of gold medals, largely thanks to those ethnically quite uh, 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 diverse athletes or players. So they're here in the Tokyo Olympic game by uh, gaining those medals, gold, silver, and bronze. So, uh, uh, but by playing in this kind of uh, very uh, 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 international uh, uh, games, I think that many people are now noticing, and particularly when I talked with my, my Chinese friend in China, they were surprised that they didn't look like Japanese because in China, there are also many uh, racially uh, 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 intermingled, mixed uh, people. Of course, uh, China has China is a quite diverse society. It has in its own quite a huge numbers ethnicities within. It. But so, but of course, at the same time, China has now some difficulties in embracing some kind of ethnic groups such as Uyghurs. So, in the sense, I think that seeing this kind of ethnic diversity might be a little bit surprising to some Chinese people when they watched uh, Tokyo Olympic game. So uh, then I uh, move on to the next slide. So uh, uh, this is not just my impression. Some scholars or news uh, journalists uh, reported in this way. Uh, in a recent uh, news article last year, uh, it is written that I quote, this growth in immigration in town is changing the image of Japan from ethnically homogeneous to uh, moderately diverse. Among Tokyo residents in their 20s, one in 10 is now foreign born, and Tokyo is no longer an outlier. Much of the migration is happening in small industrial towns around the country, such as Shimkapu in central Hokkaido, and Oizumi in Gumba Prefecture, where migrant populations make up more than 15% of local population. In the mostly rural Mie Prefecture, east of Osaka and of Kyoto, foreign migration has reversed years of population loss. So if you like go to uh, Oizumi in Gumba, it's quite interesting to see that it's like Mexico or uh, Latin American cities there are full of uh, Latino people there, and they usually speak in Spanish. So they usually go to Japanese school to learn Japanese, but in their families, they usually speak in Spanish or Portuguese. So uh, they, you can easily see those kind of, and sometimes they have Japanese citizenship, and they speak Japanese and they will work in Japanese companies. But nevertheless, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, well, they're becoming Japanese by learning Japanese. And it's similar to many Americans, I would say. Uh, many people come to the United States by, uh, uh, for, 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 for some reason, like uh, economic interest, and uh, their great aspiration to be uh, American. And they first need to speak English, and they need to then uh, really learn about American identity or American nationality or American culture or tradition and so on. So same or similar things are happening in Japan as well. So uh, it's interesting to see this kind of transformation. And then, uh, well, uh, likewise, uh, in the other uh, uh, article, which appear in the Atlantic magazine in the United States, it is uh, written, I quote again, but the approximately 2.3 million migrants living in Japan, a 37% increase from 2000 to 2017, are now testing further Japan can continue to be Japan if everyone doesn't necessarily look Japanese. Johnny, for example, sees himself and his family as Japanese, even he doesn't have the paperwork to prove it. 
We no longer yell and talk loudly inside shops and restaurants, things like that, he told me. We learn to adapt the general code of conduct in Japan. So becoming, they're becoming more and more like Japanese, uh, not just uh, by learning Japanese language, but also by learning these kind of Japanese conduct. And uh, there are more uh, Japanese people elsewhere. Like if you go to Tohoku area, my mother actually came from Tohoku area, a rural area in the northern to Tokyo. And if you go to these kind of rural areas, and if you go to many farms and those kind of places, you can see many Asian uh, people there. Uh, and uh, they're working because uh, youngsters, I mean, young Japanese people really don't like to work in a very hard agricultural sector. So they need youngsters. That's why they invite many Filipinos and uh, Indonesians or Vietnamese, and they are happy to come to Japan to work. And they work in a very difficult situation, I mean, the agricultural sector. They have to work hard. But nevertheless, uh, they work hard in these kind of agricultural sector, like farm and so on. And uh, well, then they actually often marry with, not often, but uh, usually marry with, with Japanese people there. And uh, so uh, their children are half Filipinos or half Vietnamese. So if you go to uh, elementary school or high school in those areas in northern part of Japan, you can see so many colorful Japanese people, different kind of ethnic identities, but they usually speak in Japanese. So this is quite new trends in the last one or two decades. And then uh, this is a typical, well, like uh, you can see some of the pictures in Japan, typical Japanese image, but uh, some of you might be uh, thinking that this is not a typical Japanese image. So uh, in the airport, you can see many foreigners, of course, uh, coming from Asian country particularly. And also uh, you can see some of the his Hispanic people there in the northern part of Japan. And also uh, in the factories, uh, there are full of those uh, immigrants, workers, like in the United States. So if the United States has dif some difficulties in uh, having Chinese people, it's natural that those Chinese people are now uh, 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 coming to Japan to work. So uh, it's not just that. It's interesting that I'm teaching some of the Chinese students whose parents, whose father is actually a quite senior position in Chinese Communist Party. And uh, well, actually they uh, uh, changed their names because, uh, well, uh, it's not quite convenient for them to use their original name in Japan because their parents and father have a senior position in the Chinese Communist Party. So there are many young Chinese people coming to Japan because they are familiar with Japanese culture. And uh, also uh, it's easier to come to China, Japan from China because it's nearer, language is similar, culture is similar, and uh, it, well, ethnically similar. In the sense I that uh, it's natural that more and more Chinese are coming to Japan. So in the sense, we have population problem, but uh, in some way, it's not perhaps difficult for us, I mean, for Japan to overcome some of these population problems because we're having more foreigners. So uh, the reason why we have so many foreigners nowadays, in some statistics, we have the fourth largest immigrants in the world, uh, of course, after United States, and I forget the second and the third, but uh, it depends on the, how we scale those statistics. But uh, well, well, based upon these pictures, you can also easily find out the, the, the diversity of Japanese culture. So uh, this said that well, Japan has its own national identity. Japan has had for a long time uh, a, a, a distinctive national identity which uh, combines Japanese own tradition with something new from outside, as I said. So we, because we have had that kind of tradition in more than 1,000 years. So merging modernity with tradition is a kind of a important character, I would say, of Japanese national identity. One of the largest 
enigmas of Japan is that Japan is seen as a country full of many traditional things, while traditional Japanese things. While Japan presents its image as a modern society, so uh, we have many modern buildings, but we also have many, many traditional uh, 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 temples, shrines, or those kind of old buildings in Tokyo. So you can see the both, uh, both old temples and uh, new, quite uh, modern architectures. Since the time of the ancient era, when Japan had, had the close economic and cultural exchanges with the Chinese empire, the Japanese made efforts to mix the two, namely things Chinese and things Japanese. Since the middle of the 19th century, Japan had the turn to Western civilization and began to mix it with Japanese tradition. And so this is a typical two things. I mean, quite old, Sensoji Temple at the central Tokyo. So many, many visitors, tourists, uh, actually come to this Sensoji because it's beautiful, it's huge. Of course, it's a quite old temple. This is a gate with a five stories temple besides, you can see the both. But if you walk just 15 minutes or 20 minutes from this Sensoji in Asakusa, you can arrive at this new sky tree or sky tree actually was constructed just a decade before, soon, soon, soon before uh, the uh, Great East Japan earthquake. Of course, it survived. And uh, well, it's quite high and at all, but it's quite soft and flexible, uh, like a bamboo. Actually, the architect of the sky tree uh, used uh, our Japanese historical tradition of quite soft and flexible uh, structure. Because of course, Japan in Japan, we have many earthquakes and those buildings and architectures must survive those uh, uh, earthquakes. That's why to survive, to resist those earthquakes, big, huge earthquakes, uh, Japanese uh, uh, buildings, constructs must be flexible enough to, uh, to survive and stand still. So that's why the sky tree used uh, all the traditional Japanese architectural technologies or method of having a quite soft uh, 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 structure of which can resist the great earthquake. But anyway, so uh, when uh, that architect constructed this sky tree, quite modern, and uh, this has L issued light. So it lights, I mean, of course, in the in the night time, it is uh, lighted up. Uh, so uh, it's quite uh, 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 clear and bright. You can easily see it from far away right place, but uh, well, it has quite economically um, a, a, a friendly uh, a light. So, uh, so in the sense it's modern, ecological, but at the same time it has used uh, quite a, long Japanese historical tradition of those architecture. So uh, you can see both new buildings and old buildings, but there are so many commonalities between the two. And also, uh, if you look at Sensoji Temple, this is one of the oldest example of using Chinese method of architecture. So uh, of course, in China, there are many similar kinds of architecture and the construct because we learned from Chinese method. So it's funny to know that if Fenna, some of the senior Chinese Communist Party leaders come to Japan, they really are eager to visit these places because they already destroyed most of those constructions in China. So by seeing Japanese old temples, some Chinese Communist leaders uh, can feel nostalgia of ancient Chinese imperial cultural tradition, which they already have lost. So, uh, so you can easily see the combination of the two. Then I uh, also like to cite from a leading scholar of Japan studies. Uh, let me quote from uh, Christopher Goto Jones book entitled Modern Japan. He said, quote, in many ways, the image of Japan makes it into an icon of modernity in the contemporary world. 
and yet the nation itself remains something of an enigma to many non-specialists who see it as a confusing montage of the alien and the familiar, the tradition and the modern, and even the East, Eastern and Western, unquote. So uh, I think that too many American people, when they first come to Japan, they, were, they are often bewildered at the enigma of Japanese culture. Whether Japanese culture is similar to Western civilization or not. Sometimes they feel that Japan is like, Tokyo is like New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco. But once they suddenly notice that it's totally different and both are true because that's a combination of modernity and tradition. Then I uh, also uh, would like to skip uh, some of the uh, pages because of the lack of time. And uh, well, I move on to uh, the, the new one. I mean, the current Japanese foreign policy based upon these things, a combination of modernity with historical tradition. Naturally, Japanese government respects cultural tradition of China, Korea, of course, before 1945, in, we invaded uh, Asian countries and destroyed some of their variable historical traditions or, or culture or, uh, 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 or architecture. Of course, uh, we have to be, uh, we have to apologize for that. But uh, after 1945, we changed the direction of our foreign policy and particularly Japan has been respecting uh, variable uh, culture tradition in each country like India, uh, China, Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea, and so on. They have their own distinctive and respectful historical tradition. And of course, some of them are quite alien to us. So uh, we sometimes we like to change it. Before 1945, Japanese soldiers forced them to change that, like Japanese soldier uh, forced Korean people to change their names in Japanese character. Uh, because these are seen as quite alien. We, I mean, the, some of the Japanese people before 1945 wanted to change it in a Japanese way, but I was wrong, and we are wrong in doing that. So after 1945, we began to respect those culture, but at the same time, we need modernization. We need some degree of Westernization. That's why, but combining two, we can provide some variable meaningful ODA to economic assistance to some Asian countries, because our method is slightly different from a Western way by respecting their own cultural tradition. But at the same time, they shouldn't remain the same. They need some degree of modernization to be richer, to be stronger. That's why I think that Japan can pre present a kind of a model of the combination between modernity and cultural tradition. And based upon this kind of uh, Japanese foreign policy tradition, uh, Prime, Minister Abe in 19, uh, Prime Minister Abe in 2016 launched a new uh, diplomatic strategy, and that is called a free and open in the Pacific strategy. Uh, we need the liberal internationalist tradition. We need international cooperation. Sometimes nationalism destroy peace. That's why we encourage Asian countries to, to abide by international law, international rules. But at the same time, we don't really have to radically change their historical tradition. So uh, by explaining them uh, on that, importance of international law and international rules, international order, uh, they need to uh, respect them. But at the same time, they don't have to be totally westernized. They can maintain their own culture. So uh, China sometimes criticized international law because they argue, criticize that uh, international law was created by Western people. That's why Asia uh, should not have to respect those international laws or we should, Asian people should radically modify international law. We don't think in Japan, thinking that way, we should respect those international law. But at the same time, international law should not and cannot radically uh, destroy our own cultural traditions. So international law, international laws must be plural or diverse to embrace, to be able to embrace those his, uh, cultural diversity. But that's why I think the Japanese 
this Japanese uh, diplomatic strategy is widely accepted and widely welcomed by many Asian people, of course, including India, Southeast Asian countries, Australia, New Zealand, and many European countries as well, and African countries as well. So this diplomatic, Japan's diplomatic strategy perhaps is the diplomatic strategy of free and open in the Pacific is perhaps the most important Japanese diplomatic initiative in the last 150 years. Uh, before 1945, we wanted to and we tried to create exclusive Asian order by uh, rejecting uh, Europeans and Americans, and we failed. And after 1945, we basically was following American leadership in creating international order but particularly at the time of the Trump years, because Donald President Donald Trump was not very much interested in international order. He was promoting American first strategy by rejecting or damaging some parts of international order. So instead of American leadership, I think that the Japanese government under Prime Minister Abe was trying to lead uh, uh, in this field in creating uh, international order which could be acceptable to many countries in the region. So then, uh, well, uh, Japan was connecting economic prosperity in the, in the Pacific region. Of course, uh, one of the biggest problems in East Asia is that we are Asian. And not just Japan, in Japan, but in China and in Korea, they will soon, they are already experiencing uh, the fastest uh, aging a society much faster than Japan was experiencing. And China was really fearful of that time change, transformation. So if you look at the current China's assertive foreign policy, this is uh, partly, uh, this can be partly explained by Chinese frustration. Within a decade or two, China uh, will face, the, will soon face a severe difficulty the United States is still uh, expanding in its population, but uh, China is not like that. So uh, the balance between the United States and China will be radically transformed within a decade or two. And the Chinese leaders are mindful about that concern. That's why China really, Chinese government really likes to expand its territory as fast as possible because uh, time is not on their side. So in the sense, uh, we are aging society in Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, and South Japan, Korea, and the China as well. So in the sense, Japanese strategy is quite interesting in connecting Northeast Asian economy prosperity and the cutting edge technology with emerging markets, both in South Asia and East Africa. So a Japanese, FOIP strategy is different from American FOIP strategy because American FOIP strategy is basically a strategy to contain Chinese rights. But our strategy is different. Our strategy can support Chinese economic growth by connecting Northeast Asian economic region with the other regions such as South Asia or uh, East Africa. Fair, we can see the fastest uh, growth of population. And then I like to end by uh, mentioning a little about uh, current situation. And it's interesting that uh, President Trump said that uh, uh, President Trump uh, was, said that he was willing to support a strong uh, uh, leadership of Prime Minister, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. I had never heard that American president said that the United States is, was, was following uh, Japanese leadership. It's quite interesting to hear that, but Trump was not at all interested in creating uh, international order. That's why he asked Prime Minister Abe, his friend, to lead in place of the United States. So uh, when we see the current President Biden, I, I, we can see some continuation of this trend, but nowadays uh, it's much more stronger cooperation between the United States and Japan. United States is cooperating with Japan because Japanese uh, reputation is better than uh, American reputation, particularly in Southeast Asia. 
In Southeast Asia, more than a decade, Japan is regarded as the most important and the most trustful country. It's interesting to see that not just Japan is regarded as the most uh, trustful country, but they responded that Japan is most important country for them. Most important because, not because of economic size, because of their concern of the China, because China its influence is expanding. That's why they want, I mean, Southeast Asian countries want Japan to play a larger role to balance much more assertive Chinese behaviors. For them, the trade with China is much bigger than the trade with Japan nowadays, unlike before, but they want Japan to play a larger role. And the United States government under President Biden is uh, utilizing or you try to use uh, Japan as a tool to increase American influence in the region. In the sense, the Japan alliance becomes more important than before for the United States as well. So then I like to conclude in the end that, uh, well, under the, uh, the, the strong uh, uh, cooperation and friendship between President Biden, Joe Biden, and Prime Minister uh, Suga, uh, and also this is continuing under Prime Minister Kishida as well, they are trying to create much stronger tie between the two countries. Because uh, if you look at iPhone, of course I'm using it, and some of you uh, might be using it. iPhone, if you see iPhone, of course, that is American product, American Apple product. But the 75 percentage of the components were created, produced in Japan without Japanese components. Apple iPhone cannot be created. And with its semiconductor of Korea, with its some of the components from Taiwan as well, iPhone is a product of international cooperation. At the same time, iPhone and Apple can enrich American country. So it's a good example that we need international collaboration. And it's totally impossible to separate each country individually because uh, we are really integrated. And with that integration, Apple can create such a wonderful smartphone, which dominates the world market, and uh, which dominates my life as well. But anyway, I think that the kind of integration and the partnership and the cooperation continues, regardless of international struggle and the rivalry. And the United States is in a very important place to lead, like iPhone. Without the United States, iPhone couldn't be created and produced. But uh, iPhone cannot be produced only by American goods components. Uh, it, it design was done in, in London actually. And uh, well, it's uh, a, a touch panel uh, is basically created in Japan and it's semiconductor is created, produced in Korea, as I said. So uh, I would like to present iPhone as a good example of those international friendship and the cooperation. And uh, still America is in a very good position to lead and to produce those kind of design, those kind of structure and uh, those kind of trends. So uh, with American leadership, I think that Japan can play a very important role and international cooperation can support still American prosperity and American strength. So I am here and I'm really grateful for your time. Uh, during a very difficult situation under the COVID-19. And I really want you to have much stronger interest in both Asia and Japan, because it make you, uh, 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 it enrich your understanding about the United States uh, deeper as well. Thank you very much indeed for your uh, patience and for your attention.